showtime. And this is November in two weeks, right? Are you going to do the 54321? Always like that. <laughs> Welcome to the November edition of the Hornet Spotlight, and we are excited about uh, the season, of course, as the, the leaves change and the cool weather gets here. Some of us are excited, some of us are not overly thrilled about that, but we are winding down the first quarter of the school year. Actually, we, uh, we do wind that down here uh, as we're taping it today, and the first quarter is in the books. Uh, hopefully, uh, parents who watching this will be receiving report cards in in the very very near future well you would have already let's do this again I lost track of time Mr. Showalter you just want me to pick it up okay welcome to the Hornet Spotlight for the month of November and uh, we're very pleased to have you join us here at Beach Grove High School uh, the first quarter is over the grading period ends we're well into fall now most of the fall seasons as you watch this today will have ended and we will be beginning the winter sports which here at the high school include boys and girls basketball, uh, wrestling. Uh, we also have uh, cheerleading competitions that we have uh, begun this year, and, and the cheerleaders actually watched their performance last night. Uh, they, we have a very energetic group of cheerleader, cheerleaders, and if you haven't caught them at one of the football games, or if you didn't catch them at a football game, be sure to uh, come just for the cheerleaders during basketball season if need be. But uh, a very energetic group, Ms. Snyder has taken that program over, and uh, they are in competitive cheerleading now, which is, uh, is a neat addition to our athletic program. So plenty of activities as we move into the fall season. Uh, band will be moving into the, the state competition. Hopefully, uh, we'll be bringing you good news from the band. Uh, Mr. Wynn uh, has really got the band, you know, after last year's uh, performance, the band going to the state finals and all those seniors, it, a lot of people would have said it had been a kind of a down year for the band, but they have really just picked up right where they left off. And it, it is not a rebuild band, it is, to coin the phrase, a reloaded band. They're doing a great job. The scores they've been bringing for their contest to this point have been excellent. And I know Mr. Wynn's excited, and I know the band boosters are excited. I hear them through my door every Monday of the uh, month. I think it's the third Monday of the month I hear them uh, through my door. So it. It is a very exciting time to be a Beach Grove Hornet, and we're excited, and we hope everyone will come in and join us for the band, uh, join us for the uh, athletic seasons as they begin. We also will have the VIP breakfast the first Friday in November. We always look forward to that. Our Renaissance partners coming in, and, and they always do a nice job with the VIP breakfast. So lots to look forward to. And uh, one of the most important things we do every month is recognize an alumnus of the month. And of course, as you all know, it is selected by the Renaissance Committee, composed of students, teachers, and administrators. And for the month of November, they have selected Dr. Richard Berger. And Dr. Berger comes to us from the class of 1951. And uh, that is, uh, that goes back a way, to be honest with you. And uh, but Mr. Berger is here today, and uh, congratulations, sir, on your Thank selection you. to our Hall of Fame. We Thank appreciate you. it, and thanks for coming in. Thanks for inviting uh, me. We'll we'll start right away with with the thing. You were the class of fit when I talked to you on the phone. I still don't understand. You were the class of '51, but you actually left school in 1950. How how did that work? Well, <clears throat> most of my friends were Northsiders, and um, my best friend went to Shortridge and uh, most of my social was in the north side and they were all going to college and I wanted to go with them. So I went to night school one, one semester in summer school and graduated. I had all the, uh, I had all the uh, uh, credits that I needed so I left and went to school. <laughs> went, to, went to Indiana. I, I matriculated at IU in 1950. Okay. But you're still considered class of 51? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how many of us are left. Uh, you showed me the board, and some of those people are no longer. Well, it, uh, yeah. that's a way back. Yeah. You, for, for discussion's sake, when you left 
Beach Grove High School in 1950. Where was Beach Grove High School located? We talked about On that earlier. On the corner of, of uh, 10th and Albany. And, and do you have any idea what's there now? Uh, no, but I was, I'm going down there when I be <laughs> here to see. Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, Somebody said, uh, who was Mr. Who was Mr. Showalter told me they tore down the building okay. at, uh, at 10th Street, the old grade school building. He okay. said it was condemned. All right. So I matriculated there in 1939. 1939. And um, uh, very interesting place. The, uh, we learned well the uh, three R's. Uh, and um, I told him, he, I don't know that you know, if uh, all the teachers were f ladies no male teachers and the uh, teachers in the grade school could not be married uh, my second grade teacher who was beautiful I loved her you know as a little child and she got married at Christmas and she was gone she had to leave so all the uh, all the teachers were single ladies most of them older and uh, not, nobody got beaten but uh, <laughs> they sure beat the, the, the three R's into you pretty well now, in that day, you, you say you started in 1939. There was no kindergarten at that point. You went right. No, there. there was there was a private kindergarten that that uh, that took place across the street from uh, from where I lived in the city hall. Okay. <laughs> so they had a, a little kindergarten in the city hall, and uh, a bunch of us. Uh, I was the youngest one in that in that group. Some of the older kids, but yeah, there was a, a kindergarten, private. Okay. So. Um, now, I think we talked about this before you came in. You were not a part of the group. I think you may have been before this group that uh, the high school and the middle school were in the same building and the high school one at a certain time of day and the middle school one at a different time of day. I th I'm thinking maybe no. I got my errors mixed up. No, uh, the high school and the, and the junior high were on, I mean, everybody they went were to school. All, at that time, they were all in the same building at the same time. Well, the buildings were separated. Okay. There was the grade school, then the gym, and then the, the middle school, or junior high, we called it. Mm -hmm. That was just seventh and eighth grade, and then the high school. But you couldn't walk from one building to another. Each building was built at a different time. Uh, the high school was a yellow brick building. The junior high was kind of looked like an old... Quonsidai, <laughs> you know, one of the, but a single story. And, uh, of course, the grade school was three stories, old, you know, wooden floor. Mm -hmm. The old, listen, we had inkwells. <laughs> I remember that. You remember inkwells? I, I remember the desk we had in school had the remnants of the inkwells. No, we used the inkwells. You Somebody, used them. One okay. of the monitors would come around, whoever it was, and fill up the, the wells. Now, that goes back a little bit. None of these people know what an ink pen looks like, a straight ink pen. <laughs> That's a different That's era. what we use. That's what we learned. And, and you, um, do you recall how many was in your graduating class? I think, I think around 50, somewhere around 54, 55. 54, 55. I, I'm okay. guessing. I can't remember. I had 54 graduate, supposedly graduated my dental school class, and they were, that was about the same. That was pretty small in those days, too. You you went you mentioned you already mentioned you went to IU. I went to Indiana undergraduate and then uh, to IU uh, uh, Dental School, Indiana. I left there. I graduated in 1957. That's for for you were born no, too. No, no. <laughs> Actually, I was I was going good by 1957. Oh, okay. Um, graduated from IU. So you you did your undergrad work, your graduate work, the whole thing at, at Bloomington. Well, uh, well, the undergraduate of Bloomington, and actually in those days, the first year of dental school was in Bloomington. First year of dental and medical school was in Bloomington, and in the last three years of both were at uh, on uh, e uh, East Michigan, West here, Michigan. I mean, here in town. Yeah, here. In, okay. Yes. Um, and when you left the high school, and, and you mentioned you wanted to go with some of your friends from the north side, you wanted to go on Aiken. Did you have any idea at that point in time what you wanted to, to uh, <laughs> study when you got to Bloomington? When both of your parents are dentists, <laughs> and they are beating you on the head from the time you were about four years old, I had no choice. Uh, the person across the street, the, the, the doctor who was a good friend of my folks, always wanted me to go to medical school. But I, my, my mother and dad beat this in me from the time I was, you know, able to, to speak. So, um, and, and I'm not sorry. <laughs> okay, so, but yeah. 
Uh, I, knew, I knew from the time I could t walk what I was going to do. And it was in its general dentistry. General. Family dentistry, right. whatever they call right. it now. Yeah. Family did, they have, did they have any name for it back in those days? Same just thing. a general dentist just, on the street just, corner. Just a you, don't, you don't see those anymore. <laughs> Not very many. Everybody's a specialist in the it, medical it's, fields anymore. But it's funny. Uh, things have, have evolved again. We're talking computers and things. Uh, when I, even when I was young in, in the practice of dentistry, you had to own the practice. There were no uh, all these ones on tel uh, there was one There was one advertising dentist in the whole city. One. And all he did was had uh, billboards. And if, if I owned a practice or my folks owned a practice and I didn't take over, they could not sell it to you. <laughs> they could sell it to you if you were a dentist. Right. But if you were not a dentist, you could not operate the practice out of the building. In other words, the dental practitioner had to. The, had the to other building yes. And what was the rationale for that? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> just, just more red tape. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm not sure that's the way it was in medicine. But uh, if I died, you know, my wife couldn't couldn't own the practice and hire you as a dentist. Okay. That's gone out the window for years. I don't know. Probably because there never was any real rationale for that. Yeah. I, I don't know. That goes back even before I was born. I, I never thought about why they did it that way. But I, that's I, the way it was. Yeah, uh, go ahead. You mentioned earlier, I think before, you did mention it in passing, I think, but I want to hit on it just a little bit. You practiced, when you first began your, your practice as a dentist, you were in practice with your mother and your father. I, uh, yes, correct. I was. Uh, after I got, I got out of dental school, I owed Uncle Sam because I started um, undergraduate school in uh, September, the uh, Korean War started in the summer, like July, and uh, <clears throat> at Indiana University, uh, you had you had to take ROTC uh, the first two years. In fact, that was universal in the United States land grant schools. You were obligated to take ROTC. Well, I carried that on through, and if you were um, uh, it didn't go to the service, and you 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 were obligated dental school. You were all uh, in dental school, medical school. <clears throat> you had a deferment, but you were you owed Uncle Sam seven years. So when I got out, uh, I, I went to uh, to the army for two years. Okay. So I was in the army for two years. After after dental school. After dental school, and then I came so out. So that would have been around fifty eight, fifty nine. 57 to 59, 57 I was in the Army. <clears throat> when, I gra and when I came back, I was with my folks. I also was a part-time uh, instructor to, at, the, at the dental school, and I stayed there part-time a couple days a week for about 13 years. So <clears throat> I, I did teach uh, students at the dental school. Um, uh, when you were in the service, did, did you do any uh, spend any of your time overseas, or was that all state? Well, I... I, I Tell people that I, maybe I shouldn't say this. I was in a foreign country for a while, Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I started out in Missouri. I started out in Texas at Fort Sam Houston, and then I was sent to a uh, disciplinary barracks. Great service, great people, and they closed that uh, after the election in '88, <clears throat> and then uh, I got transferred to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And, and at that point, then you practiced with mom and dad for 13 years. Oh, after that? After no. that? Oh, well, after I got out of service, I was with mom and dad till my, my parents, my dad uh, retired. Don't ask me dates. I can't remember. My mother didn't practice all that. <clears throat> in those days, there was no dental hygiene. Mm -hmm. So my mother actually, in those days, when we moved to 8th and Main Street, did mostly what we would call today dental hygiene. Okay. Uh, she did see some kids, and then uh, she got a little older. She uh, gen gentle re retired and became a mother, housewife. My dad stayed. Oh, gosh, I can't remember when he when he retired. They they then retired to Florida. You mentioned the the type of dentistry. What 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 was dentistry when you began? And we all know what it is now. 
<clears throat> what kinds of work did you do actual dental well, work did you general perform? dentistry fillings we did everything we didn't do the specialty like we did some oral surgery but <clears throat> um it, you know, if it became complicated, we'd send a specialist. Uh, root canal therapy did it if it was fairly simple. If it was complicated, we would send to an endodontist specialist. Um, but uh, things really haven't changed a whole heck of a lot, except fees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but, you know, I still practice. I'm with the Marion County Health Department. We cater where I am. We cater to the homeless and uh, people living in shelters and people uh, uh, in substance abuse programs. And that's what I, I still do it and I love it. And uh, believe me, uh, it's more rewarding than uh, being in practice because uh, uh, surprisingly there are a lot of people in this world that have nothing. And I see those people every day. Um, in fact, my wife this morning, I, I, this is a sidelight, uh, one of my patients uh, sees, helps people, and she told my wife uh, last week that she's helping a family of eight people who were in a fire, their house burned down, and uh, last Friday we took a tremendous amount of things, they were in a, in a home on um, West 29th Street, and um, my wife today is taking more things for, for eight people. And believe me, I was in that house, and there are people, it would make you cry. And there are a lot of those people that I see daily. So you are in your 50th year of practicing dentistry? Um, my, my I graduated life? from dental school in 1957. What year? So that'd be I what? 53 cool. years? Yeah, that's. Yeah, we had our 50th time. anniversary, or our uh, 50th anniversary, or uh, uh, reunion three years ago. And uh, I hate to tell you, like looking at the board out here, most of my classmates are no longer around. However, I was the youngest. I was the youngest student in my class, and. A great number of my classmates were returning World War II veterans, and uh, that would put, I still have one left, and he's not in good shape, I mean, mentally and physically. But as far as I know, all the rest of my classmates who were in the Army or in the service during World War II are no longer with us. And you are still practicing? Three days a Pretty week. amazing. Three days a week. How much longer do you think you can keep it up? When they carry me out on a gurney. <laughs> right. As long as my boss. <laughs> what, would you, what would you say is the, the secret to, to, I mean, you obviously are very active. You obviously, you know, you, I can tell you feel good. You enjoy what you're doing and you're passionate about what you're doing, oh, helping people yeah. uh, who, who have basically nothing. Uh, it, is that the passion that keeps you working? Well. Uh, yes, uh, we have a list of, uh, a lot of our patients are not well physically. Uh, many of them are diabetic. I myself am diabetic, but I am able to eat and survive that way. And uh, many of them have no teeth. We, my clinic uh, works by grants only. So we, we rely on people giving us money for, and, and, um, if you're in, if you're a dentalist, have no teeth or need dentures or partials, um, uh, you you either pay the top fee for a set of dentures, upper and lower, or uh, sixty bucks. Mm. Those dentures cost us uh, close to five hundred to have uh, fabricated in <coughs> in the laboratory. I'm using now a laboratory that I love. I used in practice. They're, they're wonderful. Uh, if you're living in a shelter and don't have any money, you get dentures, uh, you get treatment for free. Mm -hmm. if, we, uh, if you're out in town below the poverty level and uh, qualify for Wishard Advantage, um, your, your uh, fee for a visit is $6. We do almost everything. We don't do crowns or bridges, although I did do a, a, a composite crown yesterday on a guy. I had a little extra time, and he's going, he's, uh, he's homeless. Well, he's not homeless, 
but he's uh, jobless for years going in for a, a job interview today and I tried to make him look a little better uh, but it's very rewarding I don't shake yet <laughs> the only thing that hurts me is my back <laughs> and uh, I sit anyway so that's not a big deal you mentioned your parents you mentioned your your uh, wife briefly Tell us a little bit about your family, where, where all the family is now and, and what they're all doing. Well, okay, my family, I, uh, I'm married for the second time to a younger woman who's my hygienist, and we've been married 19 years. <clears throat> my, uh, my previous marriage, I have uh, four children, two boys, two girls. <coughs> um, I don't want to, they're all successful. My one's, my oldest son's an attorney in North Carolina and Raleigh. My next oldest son is a psychiatrist out of Seattle, Washington. My next is my oldest daughter. She's a CPA down in near Austin, Texas. And my youngest lives in Chicago and she's a uh, career actress. And uh, we saw her, we, she was in a play in Dayton, Ohio uh, last Sunday. <coughs> she didn't tell us she was the lead and uh, she was terrific. <laughs> oh, and, and I have uh, two stepchildren who I've adopted by my second wife. Uh, Mary Ann is a uh, uh, graduate teacher, although she doesn't teach. She has two young children. And Mitchell is a uh, unfortunate, uh, f he was in Iraq and he has uh, the, the symptoms, all the symptoms. And he's being treated at the uh, veterans as we speak. Uh, post-traumatic syndrome from being in Iraq. Well, it, it sounds like you have them all over and a lot of professional people and so uh, and you mentioned again I think before we were on air you, you do a little bit of traveling, some vacationing. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, we have a couple of timeshares. We go to uh, New Hampshire every year. This was our, this last time was our ninth year in uh, North Conway, New Hampshire, during <coughs> during um, uh, fall foliage season, and it, we just love it up there. The people in you know around the Midwest, you think that New England New Englanders are standoffish, but that's not really the case. They're very nice. Um, there's a town. My granddaughter goes to the University of New Hampshire, and we went over to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is. Uh, the only, uh, it's very slim, New Hampshire has a little slim area on the coast, on the Atlantic coast. Um, Portsmouth, New Hampshire uh, was founded in 1623 and they have still have buildings, they still have areas, they're fantastic. Uh, that's the first time we've been to Portsmouth. But uh, New, New Hampshire New, and, and Vermont, uh, j just beautiful. I mean, we don't have mountains here. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we we love we drive up there every year, and uh, the other vacations we take, we were in Yellowstone in the spring, and uh, well, we go you know we we try to travel. Uh, I shouldn't say this on on, but plane plane uh, travel is not what it used to be. So we try to keep where we can drive in a couple of days, Yellowstone. Um, uh, we'd like to go back to, uh, we have a timeshare in uh, Lake Tahoe, New York, but it's hard to get to. You've got to fly into Reno and drive down. Mm -hmm. But we've been to Yellowstone. Uh, my wife and I have, uh, we used to backpack. We've, we've climbed the uh, tallest mountain in uh, Mount Whitney. The tallest in the United States, of course, is Mount McKinley in, in Alaska, mm -hmm. but in the contiguous uh, 48, Mount Whitney, that was a trip. That's maybe why I'm getting back, <laughs> back injections, carrying 50 pounds up that mountain. That's about eight, nine years ago. You've obviously led a very full life, and you're still enjoying life at, a, at an age where a lot of people are, are struggling. What, what would you... What would you say is, has made you go all these years? What, what, is, what, what works for Richard Berger? What, what's the kind of thing that you can share with people that, that uh, lets them know that they're, any, you know, one of the things we tell our kids here at Beach Grove High School is that anything is possible from any place. And you're an example of that. That's why you're here. What works for, for you? Well, 
I don't know what keeps me going. I have good genes. My mother was, was uh, she was the smartest person I ever knew. She she kept me going pretty well. Uh, what keeps, if anybody asks me uh, how I, well, my, my philosophy, parents have to sit down to dinner. We, with my kids at home, with my first wife, uh, three of them swam competitively. You got to keep them busy, and they were always tired. But we always and and my ex-wife was a, a school teacher. She mm -hmm. taught at Northwest High School. Just retired a, two or three years ago, and um, every night we sat down together, and we talked about things every night. And I can remember uh, we talk about it, especially to the girls. What do you do in this situation? And they would say, oh, dad. And I would say, and, and one time I was at an IU football game with my best friend and uh, a situation happened near home uh, where a man in a car tried to pick up one of my, my oldest daughter and her friend and uh, she knew exactly what to do, ran home, told her mother, they called the, they called the police. Uh, and. Uh, but those things, and, and we spent a lot of time together. I, when my kids were swimming, I was involved at the Y. Uh, I, you know, I, I was with them all the time. Um, and I think that's the, the, the secret. Uh, Mary Ann, that's my stepdaughter, daughter now. Uh, uh, we're within uh, five minutes of them. We're very close to the two little kids. Uh, I call her Lefty. Her name's Zava Grace. <laughs> and I call... Uh, the little one, uh, 15 month old, I call him Henry Aldrich. You, you might remember Henry Aldrich, but I call <laughs> Cole Henry Aldrich. But we're very close, and um, you, you, you just uh, a lot of people I see in these broken homes. They just don't have. They they don't have that. They don't sit down together. They're they do this or that. But my parents hammered me, and I always told my children. I don't have, you know, I don't have anything to give you. You're going to have to go to college, and succeed. And you, you just over and over again. I, I know it's boring. Like my daughter Vicky said, "Oh, Dad, we have to talk about that again every night." <laughs> <laughs> but it might save their life, or at least, you know. Well, again, we have been with Dr. Richard Berger, who is from the class of 1951. And uh, he is the Renaissance Alumnus of the Month for the month of November. And we have enjoyed talking with you, Dr. Berger, and as a small token of our appreciation for coming in, giving up your afternoon today to, to talk with us. Um, again, and thank you for watching the Hornet Spotlight uh, for November. Again, make sure you come in, visit the high school. There are a lot of things going on as we, uh, it won't be long before we're into the Thanksgiving season, the Christmas season, and all those types of things with all the performances of the fine arts and those types of things added to the athletics, which are part and parcel to any high school. So we look forward to seeing you, and we hope you enjoyed this edition of the Hornet Spotlight.